Donna Edwards, former congresswoman from Maryland and now an MSNBC political analyst. Also, Jeb Hensterling is here, former congressman from Texas who served as chairman of the House Financial Services Committee. Uh, Jeb, I'm actually going to start with you. I'm curious as what your reaction was to what we saw in South Carolina over the weekend, what it portends uh, for not the Republican Party, per se, but for the general election, in fact. <laughs> Well, I think for the primary, it's game, set, and match for President Trump. But if I was in his campaign, I, I think I'd be somewhat concerned. I mean, you've seen in several primaries now where significant portions of the Republican primary have voted against who is the de facto Republican incumbent president. Now, there's usually a lot of kissing and making up, as we know, once the, the punitive nominee is decided. But in this case, you see a lot of polling data saying that a number of these Republicans are just going to stay home. And so, you know, when President Trump announces to everybody that uh, if you give money to Nikki Haley, you're going to be on his permanent bad list, you're not building a political movement by subtraction. You have to build it by addition. So I, I, I think, again, there are some worrisome signs for the president, um, President Trump. Uh, otherwise, I'd say right now there's about a 98, 99 percent chance he's going to be the Republican nominee. Donna, uh, I, I want to get to the funding issues in, in Washington, but your reaction to what happened in South Carolina and, you know, he just talked about some of the problems it portends for the former president. There's a lot of folks who think all of this portends a bigger problem for the current president. Well, look, I do think Jeb is right about this. I mean, I listened to uh, Donald Trump's uh, speech on, uh, on Saturday. And he didn't say anything that was about bringing his party together and sort of unifying now that he is pretty much going to seal up the nomination. And so I think it's going to make it very difficult for those voters to come on board. Look, I think this is still going to be a very competitive uh, general election. We all know that. I think uh, for President Biden, he has really, you know, pretty much consolidated the Democratic Party. He does have some challenges when it comes to response on the Israel-Hamas war, but I think that their goal is to try to uh, wrap that up. And he's got some challenges communicating his economic success so that people are feeling that at home as they go into the voting booth in, December, in uh, November. Okay, so layer on top of that what may be a government shutdown between uh, now and then. Who gets the credit? Who gets the blame if that were to happen, Donna? Well, I think that Republicans will continue to get the blame. Keep in mind, there was a top-line spending uh, deal that was made last spring uh, that was abandoned uh, by uh, the House GOP, and I think that that is really challenging at this point. They also, on the supplemental, they had a, 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 a deal on, the, on border security, and they've abandoned that. I think there's chaos in the Republican Party. It's hard to see how this gets pulled out by the end of the week. I mean, they've come off of a two-week recess, and now we're facing a partial government shutdown uh, at the end of the week. And so, um, you know, the challenge for uh, Speaker Johnson is that he can't unify his, um, his caucus, his conference, on this spending bill, and I think that that will continue to be a challenge no matter how much negotiation takes place between the Senate and the White House. Hey, Jeb, what's the chance Mike, uh, Speaker Mike Johnson is the speaker? I don't know if we were having this conversation six months from now. Oh, I'd say a very high probability. He has a lot of credibility with people in the Freedom Caucus, I think also within the broader House Republican Conference. Uh, I think they're still somewhat in, in shell shock from what happened uh, when Speaker McCarthy was uh, relieved, shall we say, from the pitcher's mound. But if I could go back to an earlier point that Don was making, and you ask about the shutdown, I think it's very noteworthy that two dozen members of the Freedom Caucus have now publicly said they are willing to accept a continuing resolution for the rest of the fiscal year. I mean, let's face it, we're already four months into this fiscal year. So this is, this is a change, and if they do that, they may miss out on what we call policy riders, and they would love to see policy riders, for example, dealing with just our poorest border. But at the same time, under the deal that was struck previously, they'll see $100 billion in savings over the current baseline should they do that. So when you ask who's going to get the blame for a shutdown, well, if you end up with a continuing resolution that Democrats don't support, in that case, 
Democrats will have shut down on their hands. Jeb, though, before I want to go back to Donna separately, and we'll see whether these things get all connected up. When you start to think about issues around the border and some of the comments that we've heard from President Trump or former President Trump and others about not actually fixing some of those situations, who's going to get the blame there? Well, look, it's really clear there was a negotiated deal in the Senate on border security. And um, President Biden actually made a lot of concessions that some Democrats, frankly, were not happy with but would have gone along with. And Republicans, because of Donald Trump in the, in the House, rejected that. And so even as they were demanding border security, they got border security, and then they walked away from border security. And so I think it's hard to argue that, um, you know, that this is real and that President Trump isn't playing a dirty hand here uh, just so that he can have an election issue. Hey, Jeb, would you have voted for... Uh for that, did, did President Trump say don't do it and everybody got in line, or was it a bad deal? It's uh, compared to what was uh, the number that were coming in, a lot of Republicans said, look, this is not a good deal. They're still allowing for way too many uh, people to come in. And it, it, I, I know Langford put the deal together, but would you have voted yes for that deal? Well, one, I actually reserve the right to read a bill before I vote on it. I think there were a number of good provisions uh, in there, but I want to go back to something that Donna said. I mean, there's not a law that necessarily has to be passed here. It is night and day how the border was secured under President Trump versus President Biden. So much of this rests on executive authority. And it's clear that President Biden, up until he has seen his declining polls, has paid little to no attention of what's going on on our southern border, where we have the United Nations basically coming across. These people aren't vetted. We don't know who they are. And so finally, the president, President Biden, was forced to act, but he could do this on his own. There doesn't have to be a new law for him to simply enforce. They won. He repealed all the executive orders of President Trump on the border. So listen, there's no doubt in my mind, come election day, of who's going to get blamed for uh, the crisis at the border. It's going to be President Biden.